Hello and welcome to this Tolly Seminars online lecture where I'm going to be taking a look at the latest case involving that good old hot potato as to whether somebody is employed or self-employed. My name is Chris Jones. Now, of course, the issue of overemployed and self-employed is very much a question of fact in each individual case. And therefore, in order to determine whether somebody is employed and self-employed, we do need to look at the entire situation that is relevant. But also, we cannot take comfort from the fact that in one particular case, an individual is found to be um, self-employed because that doesn't form a precedent unless their facts are absolutely identical. Now, of course, the issue is not just a matter of tax. It also affects the individual's rights for things like employment as to whether the, that individual could indeed claim certain social security benefits if their contractual relationships came to an end or that they're entitled to a termination package on ending of that contract. But of course, the issue has been very much related to tax because, of course, it is an issue which does indeed impact quite significantly the amount of national insurance contributions that they've paid. So therefore that is why there have been so many cases taken by HMRC in this area. It's not the fact that really that HMRC are particularly bothered about whether somebody has employment rights, that's of no consequence to them. It is the national insurance which is in point. Because, of course, if you are self-employed, you pay just one lot of national insurance at a lower rate than if you are an employee. And, of course, employees pay not only a higher rate of national insurance, but their employer also pays a swathe of secondary contributions on top of that. And, indeed, if you set yourself up through your own small limited company, there is a way of actually structuring your arrangements, unless you are caught by IR35, of course, where you pay no national insurance. So it's because of the national insurance point that this has been such a well-trodden area for HMRC among the courts and the tribunals. So let's take a look back at the various cases that were cited in this particular recent case, which is set out in your notes, which I will talk through shortly. But basically, the fundamental cases in my mind that underpin this very important point on employed and self-employed is firstly the case of ready mixed concrete that dates back as far as 1968 that basically says that if the hallmarks of employment exist i.e. all of them then the individual is employed however if not all of those hallmarks of employment exist then the individual by definition is essentially self-employed or not employed. Now, what I like about this particular case is that the default position is that unless HMRC can prove that all the hallmarks of employment exist, the individual is self-employed. So therefore, your starting point is that the individual is self-employed unless HMRC can prove that they are employed. Whereas if you don't cite this case in your argument, you start with the standing point that HMRC want, and they want to start with the fact that the individual is employed unless you can prove them self-employed. So using ready mixed concrete can, if you pardon the pun, put HMRC's feet into a level of concrete because of course they then have to prove that those hallmarks of employment then exist to count them as an employed individual. The other important case in this area, in my mind, is the approach taken in Hall and Lorimer. Not necessarily the facts, because, of course, as I said earlier, the facts are very individual to each case. But it's actually the approach taken, whereby, yes, you can set out on a checklist a certain number of factors and tick box exercise and scores, etc., etc. But as the judge in Hall and Lorimer said, is once you've painted your picture, you then take a step back. And you look at that picture and you ask, what have you painted? This is sometimes known as the Monet effect. If you stand yourself very close to a Monet, say the, uh, the uh, lily pond, and you actually just look into the uh, picture, you just see lots of greens and blues, a bit of purple. You can't really see a lot until you really stand back and look at what it is. I've often been described as myself as a, as a Monet, um, which I took quite as a, as a compliment. But of course, uh, when later on somebody said, do you realise what a Monet actually is in this context? That you're good, but only from a distance. But that's the point. Take a step back. Look at it from a distance and ask yourself, have you just painted the picture of somebody who is genuinely employed by someone else or somebody who is in business on their own account? So let us take a look now at those hallmarks of employment as set out in Hall and Lorimer.
Firstly, there needs to exist the mutuality of obligations. Each party needs to be bound to each other, one to provide the services and the other one to give a certain level of work. If that exists, that's a hallmark of employment. There needs to be a sufficient level of control, a master-servant relationship between the individual doing the work and the individual paying for that work to be done. How much control is exerted? How much control needs to be exerted? If there is sufficient control, that is a hallmark of employment. And finally, you take a rounded look at the remaining terms of the arrangement between the two parties. And this is often where the grey areas come in in reality. Let's take a more detailed look then at those other factors that we will consider. So we do, of course, look at control, but we'd also look, and we've seen this in a lot of the recent IR35 cases, the ability to substitute. If you are employed by someone, you basically are required to turn up and do your job. You cannot send somebody else on your behalf. That is not acceptable within the contract. So therefore, the existence of a workable substitution clause, which could genuinely be invoked and used, would therefore trigger the individual being self-employed. The degree of financial risk. If you are self-employed, you assume some financial risk. If you are employed, the only risk you assume is the fact that you could at some point in the future be made redundant, in which case you have certain amounts of rights in any case. The provision of equipment. Normally, if you're employed by somebody, they provide the equipment for you to do your job. If you're self-employed, you are expected to provide that yourself. The basis of payment. If the work is being billed for based on the work being done, then that is more indicative of self-employment, whereas if you're simply being paid an hourly rate, that is more indicative of employment. Whether employee rights exist in the terms of employment law, because that, of course, would uh, um, assume then that, that if you have employment rights, that you are likely to be an employee for tax purposes as well. What would happen on termination of the contract? Who can terminate? What are the rights at the end of that contract? If it's uh, an ongoing mutual contract, that's looking much more like employment, of course, one of those standard hallmarks. One of the things that's become quite apparent more recently is whether you are part and parcel of the organisation. Is there a difference, in other words, between what you do and how you work and how other people in that organisation work who perhaps are termed employees and under PAYE? So, We've seen recent decisions have a look at this particular point. And does the contractor distinguish between their contractors, the people that they engage to do certain pieces of work, and the people that they employ and put through payroll? And we'll have a look at that in a recent case shortly. And the exclusivity of services. If you are bound only to provide services for one particular contractor and not allowed to provide services for anyone else, that is much more looking like employment because that, of course, uh, is what we see in covenants embodied into an employment contract. So let's turn now to this point about painting a picture. So once you've looked at all of the factors, you then stand, you paint your picture and you stand back and have a look at it. Now, this approach was reaffirmed in the 2008 or so case of Novasoft, where it was concluded that once you took account of all of the relevant factors and stood back and looked at it in the round, the approach taken by the first tier tribunal judge, Peter Kempster, was you actually had painted the picture of somebody who was in business on their own account. And this applied, even though Novasoft Limited, this was an IR35 case, could not clearly show a lack of control or the presence of a workable substitution clause or even a lack of mutuality of obligation. The fact was that once you looked at the whole picture, that looked like that you were looking at somebody who was not employed by the person they were doing the work for ultimately. And as such, the individual was treated as self-employed. And one of those important factors here was there was a clear distinction between the contractor, in this case, Mr. Brakovich, and the employees of the company that he was working alongside. So he, for instance, didn't have holiday entitlement, sick pay. He didn't have full access to the company network. He didn't have rights to go to the Christmas party. These sorts of things, there's a real clear distinction. So therefore, when you actually looked at Mr. Brakovich and you compared him with the employees of that organisation, there was a sufficient difference between the two sets of people that stood him apart. And that meant, of course, that he was self-employed for taxation purposes. So let us turn now to the very latest case 
tax case number 4006, the case involving EMS, which is laid out in the notes supporting this month's issue. EMS basically was engaged by insurance companies to recover damaged motor vehicles from the side of roads to obviously get them uh, taken away for assessment by that insurance company. Now, EMS was a large organisation and it had various contractors that it worked with. One of those was DKM Services. And basically, DKM Services were paid an hourly rate by EMS on presentation of invoices. So basically, EMS in a certain area of the country engaged DKM Services to go and recover damaged motor vehicles from the side of the road. DKM was owned by Mr M and he relied almost solely on the work provided to him by EMS. EMS were by far and away his largest customers, took up a vast majority of his time. The first tier tribunal said that EMS had to demonstrate in order to avoid applying PAYE to the pay that they were giving to Mr M, they had to actually demonstrate that he was self-employed. In other words, we are looking here at uh, the default position being that the individual must be employed unless EMS can show that he was self-employed and confirm that there is no magic formula in making that assessment. So rightly in their arguments, EMS did put forward the ready mix concrete case and actually posed the question, did the three hallmarks of employment exist? Were there mutuality of obligations? And in this particular case, there was no guarantee of work from EMS to DKM services. In other words, if the work dried up, that was the end of it. That was the end of the contract. So, yes, there was no mutual obligation. Number two, was there sufficient control exercised by EMS over the work undertaken by Mr. M? Well, basically, they agreed with Mr. M the areas that he would serve, the type of uh, recovery that he would require to do, where he was required to put the vehicles, etc. But once that helicopter view was taken by agreeing what needed to be done on a, um, an overall basis, then they basically left it to Mr. M just to get on with it and therefore didn't exert any day-to-day -day control over what he did or how he did it. So therefore, no, there was not sufficient control. And then thirdly, of course, we look at the remaining terms, whether they are written or simply based on how the parties work together with each other. Was there any substitution? Could DKM services provide the services of other people? Well, no particular mention was made in the case on this, um, so therefore we can't really comment further. But of course, what uh, EMS services were looking for, EMS wanted those vehicles recovered. I'm not sure they were particularly bothered whether Mr. M particularly did it himself, or as long as those vehicles were recovered and put in the, the, the area required before by the insurance company, I'm sure that wouldn't have mattered. But this wasn't specifically raised um, in this particular case. Was there any financial risk assumed by M? Well, he did run the risk, of course, of uh, um, the customer defaulting, and he didn't stand with the rights of an employee in respect of uh, suing for any unpaid bills by EMS. So there was a degree of financial risk that he assumed. Who provided the equipment? Well, this was provided by M. He had to provide the breakdown vehicle, etc., to tow the vehicles away. He also had to include in that his safety clothing, etc. So, yes, the provision of equipment was by DKM services, which is much more ind indicative of somebody who is self-employed. Now, the basis of payment in this particular case was not particularly helpful in the fact that he was not paid to do a job. He was actually paid an hourly rate. So it wasn't actually paid for by ve by vehicle recovered. It was actually paid by the hour. So that wasn't helpful in trying to show that he was uh, self-employed. But nonetheless, he only was paid when he worked. He had no rights to holiday or sick pay. He only literally got paid when he did the work. Did he have any employment rights? He did not appear to have any such employment rights based on the contractual relationships between the parties. With regard to the termination of the contract, well, there was no mention of this in the uh, particular case, but uh, essentially, if the work did dry up, there was no mutual obligation for EMS to keep providing it. And there's certainly seen from the fact there was no employment rights, there would be a termination payment given to Mr. M. Was he part and parcel of EMS? Well, no. He had to arrange his own training to do the job. He had to make his own pension arrangements. He had to insure himself for the work that he was doing. Whereas if they were uh, individuals who were employed by EMS, and they did indeed have a number of employed people, 
then EMS provided the training, they provided pension arrangements, they provided insurance. So therefore there was distinction between the employees and in this case the contractor Mr M. And finally, was there exclusivity that you'd expect to see in an employee-employer relationship? And no, there wasn't. EMS did not have exclusive rights over M services. The fact that they provided him with so much work meant that they almost had him exclusively was irrelevant because basically Mr. M, if he was made a bigger, better offer by another recovery or insurance company, he could have gone there. And that would have been um, EMS's problem to have filled the hole that he would have left behind. So he was not exclusively bound to work only for EMS. So the conclusion of the first tier tribunal in this very important case was the fact that M was an independent contractor and PAYE and NIC did not have to be accounted for via the payroll of EMS. Well, it's useful that that decision has gone the way that we would have hoped because, of course, this is one of the most problematic areas us tax professionals have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Many thanks for listening to this lecture. My name is Chris Jones, Director of Tax Markets at Tolly.